uh, welcome everybody today to our Closing the Gap um, Kickstarter Funding Guidance and Q&A webinar. Okay, so we're joined today, um, the webinar team, we're going to have Simon Gilbody, our Network Director, Emily Peckham, our Network Coordinator, and Paul is also on call today, who um, works as part of the network, and myself. We just need to encourage everybody to follow us on Twitter. We're hoping that for people who haven't been able to log on to this webinar today, they might be leaving us some questions on Twitter and we'll be having ongoing conversations. We'll be posting um, bits of news from this webinar, all of the documents through our Twitter account over the course of the next week or so. And also just a reminder to go to our website for all of the funding information. Okay, so I've just whizzed through the webinar housekeeping before. But again, just wanted to let you all know that we are recording this session. So that means that people who can't attend can listen back and you can also listen back. Okay, so the webinar today is divided into three parts. The first part, Simon's going to tell us a bit more about the network, just to recap, because we might have some new people on the webinar today who haven't been to any of our previous sessions and want to know a bit more about us. The main part of the webinar, part two, Emily's going to be telling us a bit more about the Kickstarter funding round and going through that call guidance and starting to look at some of the frequently asked questions that we are starting to get about that and hopefully make it all a bit clearer for you. And then we're going to end in part three by discussing our research framework in a bit more detail. Um, research aims, goals and questions that we're starting to come up with as a network and that might help you as you're starting to formulate your ideas for your funding applications. So before we start, we just wanted to know a little bit about our audience today. Okay, great. So it look, it's looking like we've got quite a few researchers, a couple of practitioners. Okay, so we have got a few more researchers, but it's great that we've got a couple of others and practitioners as well. So hopefully we'll try and make sure that we cover the content um, so it's not just specific to the, the researcher audience. Okay, so that's enough from me. Just to say thank you to all of our founding partners who have helped with the setup of the Closing the Gap Network. And just there on that slide. And I'm going to hand over now to Simon Gilbody, who is going to give us an intro to the network. Okay, thanks everyone. Okay, good afternoon to everyone. I'm Simon Gilbody from the University of York and the Holyoke Medical School. And I'm the director of the Closing the Gap UKRI Network. So it's a very exciting. Um, program that we are um, seeking to kickstart with our first funding round today. Um, I'm very grateful to Jess and all the people behind the scenes who have enabled us to have this webinar today. Um, I'm going to say a few words about the network just to give you a sense of what we're about and to help guide your thinking and how you might best respond to this first funding round, this first Kickstarter funding round. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the gap is and how did we get here. So, um, um, I'm just going to click through to my next slide. So our network is one of eight networks that have been funded by UK Research and Innovation. So we're based at the University of York, but we've got partner organisations in London and at the University of Keele at Medical School there, and also in our medical, uh, our medical school here at Paul York. And um, the other networks are represented there. And you can see that UKRI is supported by a number of different um, funding bodies and you can see each of their individual symbols there including the medical research council some councils that i've not heard of um, before this network call but importantly epsrc and the esrc so um i'm flicking through some of my slides just now but um, if we come back to what for us is a very important slide which um is um illustrates the nature of the problem we seek to address within this network. So people with the most severe forms of mental ill health, so typically people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, experience some of the most profound uh, health inequalities and a gap in their mortality and life expectancy of any section of the population. And I'm going to show that with reference to a graph that some of you might have seen before. So this is a graph that shows and tracks life expectancy over time, over the past 30 years, for both the general population and for people within that population with some of the most severe forms of mental ill health. So we can see lines there in red for women and in blue for men, and two lines go upwards, going from 1980 to 2010. And these are the figures for um, the broader population. You can see that life expectancy 
has been increasing, gradually increasing year on year since 1980. But there are two other lines that tell a very different story for people with the most severe forms of mental ill health within that population. So in this case, this is people um, with um, schizophrenia. And we can see that life expectancy is going in exactly the opposite direction for this group of people. And we see this as a profound health inequality that has been historically present, but seems to be getting worse over time. And we see that as an important challenge for health services and for society at large. So we see from data such as those presented in that graph, the data that we see from surveys elsewhere, more recent data that life expectancy for people with some of the most severe forms of mental ill health is reduced by around 20 years. And um, just in this graph, in this slide, I can show you a figure that I've taken from um, a publication by Public Health England that shows the relative prevalence of long-term physical health problems such as obesity, such as asthma, diabetes, and chronic respiratory illness, and coronary heart disease, for people with the most severe forms of mental ill health compared to the general population. And we can see that the likelihood of experiencing long-term health problems such as those is increased by a factor of 1.5, almost double in many of these long-term conditions. So this gives us some insights what some of the important drivers for this health inequality might be. And one of the important drivers is that the prevalence of long-term physical health problems is increased several fold. So this is a big problem, this is a problem that's only recognised and it's a problem that seems to be getting worse rather than better over time. So we think that the causes of what I'm going to call this gap, this mortality gap, this health gap, are quite complex and multiple. And complex problem is going to need an innovative, thoughtful um, solutions. And that's what we propose to do. So just thinking about what the important drivers of this health and mortality gap are for people with severe mental ill health? Well, we've already seen that long-term preventable and modifiable physical health problems like chronic respiratory illness are much more common for this group of people. We also know that some of those behaviours that we know are not good for your health that pose a risk to people's health, such as smoking, such as poor diet, and such as relative physical inactivity, are also much more prevalent for this section of the population. But we also know that some of those broader social factors that are also detrimental to people's health and life expectancy, such as unemployment, are much more common amongst people with severe mental ill health. And we also know that people with severe mental ill health um, often live in relative poverty and in uh, less than ideal living circumstances. Um, and the, the deprived circumstances are important drivers in um, determining people's health and life expectancy and this is a much more um, prevalent problem amongst people with severe mental ill health. We also know that health services historically have not been as good as they should be at addressing these needs so the provision of care and the management of long-term health problems is suboptimal for people who use mental health services. But we also know that the medications that people take in the management of their long-term mental health problems can have side effects that are also detrimental to people's physical health and the most notable example is the side effects of long-term antipsychotic medication and um, one of the most important side effects is that it causes people to put on weight and this for example feeds into the increased prevalence of type 2 diabetes for that population but the last thing i will say is that people who use mental health services experience stigma and discrimination and social isolation and social exclusion. And we know from lots and lots of research, some research that's been conducted by members of our consortium, that these are detrimental to people's physical health. So this is a complex series of drivers of poor physical health for people with severe mental ill health. And what we find useful in conceptualising this is something that I'm going to call a roadmap. A roadmap that represents the social determinants of health. So this is quite a well-recognised, well-reported roadmap that's been useful for conceptualising the determinants of health in the population more generally. And we think this is useful for indicating where we would like to be in terms of generating research and innovation in this area. So we start with people, people are at the centre of this diagram, and it moves right the way through a series of shells around the audience 
to right on the outside, we're interested in the impact of the global ecosystem on people's health and how that might disproportionately affect people with some of the most severe forms of mental ill health. So that gives you the, an indication of the types of people that work within our network and the types of research that we would like to stimulate within our network. So the focus and the aims of the Closing the Gap Network are going to be outlined over the next few slides. So our focus is going to be to understand and to reduce the physical health and the mortality gap experienced by people with the most severe forms of mental ill health. And we aim to do this in two ways. The first is we seek to understand the causes and the consequences of the health and mortality gap for this population. And this forms the basis of our first platform for funding, our first Kickstarter round, understanding more deeply the causes and consequences of long-term physical health problems and the mortality gap for this population. And then we seek to go on to identify the most effective ways of mitigating these causes and consequences, how we might intervene or change things such that um, the gap in health and life expectancy is reduced in some way. So I'm coming close to the end of my slides. We seek to research and kickstart research in this area and we have some funds to support that and we want to innovate in this area. And it's really important for us and it's one of the founding principles of our Closing the Gap Network that we take what is known as an interdisciplinary approach. So within our network and the people that we wish to draw more broadly into our network, are people drawn from the arts and from technological science and from the humanities and from clinical science and from economic and social and political science. We're um, very keen to embrace the perspectives of environmental science and population science. So not everyone's welcome within this network. We feel that you've all got something to contribute. And we seek to build capacity to undertake research and to mobilize knowledge around best practice. So finding things that we discover work and then finding how we can ensure that those things move into practice and inform policy formulation. And we're keen to do this not just in Europe, not just in Kiel, not just in the north of England, but nationally throughout the United Kingdom. And we're also keen to move beyond the, the, um, the, the, the borders of um, the United Kingdom to work internationally. We're beginning to do that as well. And at the end of our funding period, we want there to be a footprint and to have made a splash and to have left a legacy. We want to ensure that the landscape in researching and understanding the drivers of this mortality gap, this health gap, are much better, much better embedded. And there is something there that wasn't there before we started this endeavour. So I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Dr. Emily Peckham, who is going to tell you a little bit about the process of the Closing the Gap Kickstarter funding round. We're very excited about this. We want to see lots and lots of applications from people that we've not worked with before. And we see this as a great opportunity to make a lasting impact and to move the dial in relation to the health gap that exists for people with severe mental ill health, one of the most profound health inequalities that exists for any section of the population. So over to Emily now. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Simon. So, my name is Emily Peckham, and I'm the coordinator for Closing the Gap Network. So, I'm just going to tell you a bit more about the Kickstarter funding round and starting with the core guidance. Okay, so the first funding call, we're looking to offer people short term support, and that's to allow the investigation of new ideas, collaborations and partnerships in the area of severe mental ill health. We want to stimulate research into, into the inequalities that people with SMI experience and to build cross-disciplinary research capacity. Our two main aims are to understand the causes and consequences of the health and mortality gap and to identify the most effective means to mitigate these causes and consequences. So those are the two, aim, two overarching aims we're looking at to address within this funding call. So key information about the funding call. The project should consist of well-defined activities and must have a clear objective. 
We're funding projects from £2,000 up to £30,000 and projects should be planned for a period of up to 12 months to be completed by the 31st of November 2020. So, is my organisation eligible to apply? So applications must be led or co-led by a UK Higher Education Institute and that's due to UKRI funding requirements and it's UKRI that provided the funding for the Closing the Gap Network. Non-academic bodies, charities, third sector organisations and other relevant bodies are welcome to apply. Projects co-led by HEI in partnership with non-academic groupings are strongly encouraged. So we're really looking for people to partner up with people in non-academic groupings to form um, collaborative projects. In terms of whether or not uh, a non-UK um, organisation can apply for funding, the project must be led by a UK Higher Education Institute and the, the project must benefit the UK. So, but the second of our poll, have you identified an HEI part? So most of the people who replied, oh, oh sorry, all the people who replied have found identified an HEI partner, but if you didn't get a chance to re reply to the poll and you haven't identified an HEI partner and need to do so and are struggling to find one, please do get in touch with us at Closing the Gap and we'll help you to identify someone. More um, information about who's eligible to apply. So this is about early career researchers. So applications from early careers researchers are strongly encouraged and that's either as a co-investigator where the applicant is yet to gain an independent permanent position or as a PI if they're in the early stages of an academic or research career with a long-term position. And if the main applicant is on a fixed term contract with a contract end before the end of the project or very shortly afterwards, a further project supervisor who will take over and oversee the completion of the project should be named on the application. So, next poll, are you an early career researcher? Yes, um, so we've just had a question, do you allow for the junior um, researcher to be co-PI? Yes, that would be fine for junior researchers to be co-PIs. So we had a mixture of early careers researchers and non-early career researchers who responded to our poll, so that's quite good. Good to see we've got some early careers researchers listening to the webinar today. Okay, so how do we decide who gets funded? So that's some important information. So, and this information can all be found in our guidance notes. So we have an independent shortlisting panel whose members will assess and score proposals against predefined criteria. So the shortlisting panel consists of academic, um, senior academics within the University of York, senior academics outside the University of York, um, a representative with lived experience and non-academic partner representatives as well. So we've got a range of people and all the people on the panel are independent. So it's an independent panel who will be assessing the um, proposals. And the criteria we're assessing against are research excellence, feasibility of the project, engagement and collaboration, value for money and ethical issues. So each of the five criteria will be scored on a 0 to 5 scale leading to an overall score and you can see the descriptors below and the descriptors can also be found within the funding guidance document and feedback on applications will be informed by these descriptors. And short qualitative statements but not numerical scores will be shared with applicants if they wish to hear anything. So what must my application cover? There must be a clear description of the project aims and possible impact if the project's realised. A summary of the evidence that currently supports the concept of the project and the gap in the current body of evidence. There must be a project plan and commentary on the significance of the results intended to be obtained. And there should be a statement on how the project aligns with the network's core principles. And in a few moments I'll explain to you what the network's core principles are. And there must be some potential for the term impact and plans for say sustainability. So we're looking for projects that are kickstarter projects that are possibly then going to lead on to larger funding applications to big, for bigger funding. Um, and then also we're looking at plans for dissemination of findings. 
So what do you plan to do with your findings and how do you plan to disseminate them once you've got them? So the core principles of the network are sharing, participatory, inclusive, engaged, innovative and outward facing. So just a little bit more information on these core principles. So in terms of sharing, we're looking for a collective vision and endeavour, participation, co-production and co-ownership. Participatory, we want to include people with lived experience in the research. And if you're struggling to, to know how to include people with lived experience, then please do get in contact with us and we can advise you. We want active engagement with those involved in policy, delivery and practice. We want it to be inclusive, so a sensitive and supportive approach and commitment to understanding and contextual basis. Engaged, so integration of local advocates and community members into network activities. Working with people with lived experience. Innovative, so a commitment to novel approaches and a commitment to interdisciplinarity. Outward facing, so effective communication and knowledge exchange before, during and after research. Engagement with the external research community and policy and delivery relevant. So we're looking at research that will encompass some of these core principles of the network. It might be difficult to encompass all of the core principles, but you should aim to encompass at least some of these core principles within your, within your research application. So how much should I really bid for? Something that everyone usually wants to know. So we're funding projects from 2,000 up to 30,000, and the maximum size of award is up to 30,000, but the application should be aligned to appropriate funding required to carry out the activity that you wish to do. We're anticipating that the majority of the projects will be in the 10 to 15,000 pounds region, but, and small awards will be around 10,000 and larger awards up to 30,000. And the large awards would be an exceptional award with an exceptionally um, strong application. And the total funding available in this round is 100,000 pounds. So what costs will the grant cover? The grant costing should show 100% of full economic costs of the proposed research and we will fund 80% of FEC. And this is in line with UKRI guidance. If you want to look up further about what FEC is, you can follow the link below, and that will give you more information. If you've got an academic partner already identified, they will be able to help you with this as well. So in terms of allowable costs, and again, all this information can be found in the guidance document, Funding may be sought to cover the direct expenses incurred in the planning, conducting and developing the research, and this can include the project planning and development costs, research expenses, including participant reimbursement, transcription, consumables, including the purchase of data set, photocopies, microfilms, and any other minor items that were used during the course of the project, short-term consultancy or salary costs for expert staff, travel and subsistence, investigators' time, administrative costs and estates and indirects. So the next slide now shows a template of the costing form that we've got in the application form. So you can see that on one column we've got um, the cost of 80% FEC where you enter that mark part and then you also put, put the cost for the 100% FEC and then the total is the final column. So the total is if you had some accommodation and you wanted to do a line by line costing, so costing each of the accommodation lines that you think you might have, then you can do it like that. Or you can just put an overall cost in. It's up to you, whichever you wish to do. So this um, form just shows the allowable costs. So what's not currently eligible for funding? Awards will not be made retrospectively. So the work for which support is requested must not have commenced before the award, the award is announced. We won't fund computer hardware or books or other permanent resources or publication costs. And again, this is in line with UKRI guidance. One thing that's really important is to ensure that your project provides value for money and projects will be assessed against whether or not they provide value for money. So are the funds requested acceptable in relation to the planned work and the outcomes likely to be achieved? So really make sure when you're thinking about the costing, whether the, the funds are reasonable in terms of what you're trying to do. Does the proposal demonstrate value for money in terms of the resources requested? And will the proposed project add value to the research field? And really 
worthwhile thinking about will, will our funding or resources be contributed from outside this funding stream? So if you've got somebody who's going to do a bit of work for you who's not asking for any funding, then, then it's worth including that in the um, funding or resources that's contributed from outside this funding stream. Or if there's any other resources that you've got that are not that you're not asking for funds for, then please do in, include those in the funding stream. Um, sorry, include those in the funding um, document because that's really useful for us to know and will strengthen your application. So this um, slide now just shows if you have some funding or resources that will be contributed from outside the funding stream, where you can record them, the amount and what they're like, what they are. So if they're cash or if they're in kind. So how do you submit your application? Application forms should be submitted to the CTG network email address shown on the screen. An email should carry the subject line CTG funding proposal and then the lead applicant's surname. And funding need, fund applications need to be submitted by 5 p.m. on Monday the 30th of September. The word form can be downloaded from the website to make the funding application. Please note that you need to include a CV for the principal applicant and any co-applicants. The CV should be included at the end of the application form and CVs must not be sent as separate files because they're liable to get lost or mixed up. Your CV should be no longer than two sides of A4 and if you do not attach a CV, Royal Investigators will automatically withdraw your application. If you wish to attach a Gantt chart for the application then you can do so if you wish. So in terms of ethical considerations, you need to consider what, if there are any ethical issues that you believe are relevant to the proposed research project and what ethical approvals have been obtained and from whom and will be sought if the project is funded. If you believe an ethics review is not necessary, please explain why. We'll be looking to assess whether the ethical or research government issues have been appropriately identified and whether the success, satisfactory plans in place to address any ethical or governance issues. And are there clear plans in place for storing and if appropriate sharing data? And all of that's important in accordance with GDPR guidelines. And there is a section on the form that asks about ethical considerations. So what info is required about intellectual property and contracts? So in terms of intellectual property, please detail how you've considered the intellectual property implications of your project and how it will be protected if you if there isn't any intellectual property that will be generated, any patents or agreements that are in place to date, any disclosures that would prevent the protection of relevant IP, and any existing arrangements with third parties if relevant, including funders of work to date who may assert their right to IP. So make sure you include all that in the funding application form as well. And that comes under the what pre-existing intellectual property rights are to be used on the project and will they be improved? And will new rights be created? So, in terms of the key dates, the funding call opened on the 9th of July 2019. We're holding this first webinar on the 23rd of, 3rd of July today, and we'll be holding another webinar on the 7th of August 2019, where we'll be having some of the other theme leads attend this webinar, and so they'll give a bit. They could give a little bit of information about their theme. So it'll be slightly different to this webinar, but again, we'll, we'll um, answer key questions if anyone has any in the next webinar as well. So at the end of this webinar, we'll be answering questions. And in, if you have any questions that you come up with in between the two webinars, then you can ask them at the next webinar or alternatively email the CTG website and we can then answer your questions there. We'll also be putting a frequently asked questions upon document up on the website following this webinar so you can look at that as well for advice on FAQs. We're going to be holding a sandpit event in York on the 9th of September 2019 and that's for people who intend to apply for funding to get together, discuss their funding application and seek support from theme leads and also if you need to find other people to collaborate with there will be an opportunity there to find potential collaborators as well on your project. And the funding call application deadline is the 30th of September 2019. So the next poll, do you already have a formed idea for an application? So again, it's about seems to be about half and half in terms of who's had already has an idea for an application and who doesn't. 
if you want some advice on your application, you've got a sort of an idea and you need some further guidance, please do get in contact with the team leads. Their contact details can be found on the, the CTG website and um, it's really worth getting in contact with the firm team leads prior to making an application to discuss with them what you're planning to do and seek any ideas and guidance from them. So I really would encourage you to get in contact with team leads and one of the questions on the form is have you have you um, worked with any of the theme leads in developing your proposal so really worth if you haven't already done so getting involved with the theme leads and seeking their guidance and speaking to them about your project proposal so now we're moving on to the part three of our presentation today and that's talking about our research framework and our network research aims goals and questions and that if you haven't already got an idea about what you might want to do but you do want to apply for some funding this may help you generate an idea so we have two overall aims of the network the first being to understand the causes and consequences of the health and mortality gap in people with smi and aim b to identify the most effective ways to mitigate these causes and consequences we've got a variety of research themes within this network health and social inequality art and creativity green and blue space, digital technologies, knowledge mobilisation and research and practice, and big data. And what we've done is we've taken the, the different themes and the different aims and generated some research questions for goal A and some research questions for goal B. As I've just said, our research for OK, we've got green and blue space, big data, digital technologies, arts and creativities. These are our um, separate themes and you can see this is a screenshot taken from the website for information on these from the website and it tells you who the theme leads for the different themes are and then we've also got some cross-cutting research themes and these cut across all the different four themes that we've already mentioned so we have the health and social inequality theme which is led by professor kate pickett and dr stephanie prady we also have knowledge mobilization and research in practice Research and practice is led by Dr. Wanda by Forsberg of the Equality Trust, and knowledge mobilization is led by Rachel Churchill. So that is our research framework again. So research goals A. So these are goals that are looking to understand the causes and consequences of the health and mortality gap. So we've got five questions here that we're looking at, or five areas. So to understand how people with SMI perceive and use green and blue space, and the nature of any differences between that and the way they use it in the general population. To explore how integrating data sets on health status and use of health services with other data sets such as environmental data can deliver new insights into the determinants of health for people with SMI. To develop ways in which digital technologies can be used to reveal the connections between personal health, activity and lifestyle for people with SMI. To explore innovative, creative ways to engage people with SMI in the network to increase well-being and physical activity. And to understand the role of social and economic vulnerability in both generating worse health for people with SMI and in the individual's ability to make gains from an intervention. And our research goals B are to identify the most effective ways to mitigate these causes and consequences. So to determine the most effective roles and responsibilities of the primary and secondary healthcare sector sectors in understanding and supporting people with SMI and supporting interventions, to determine the effectiveness of existing interventions to promote the use of green and blue space for people with SMI, to design and pilot new initiatives including technology-based interventions such as digital technologies to increase physical activity of people with SMI, to determine the best ways to prevent initi initiatives from generating further health inequalities through social and economic vulnerability and investigate promising initiatives that reduce them. And finally, to develop a new data resource, including integration of data sets for further research on inequalities affecting people with SMI. So we did some co-development work to develop these research questions and we'll just mention a little bit about that now. So we held a launch event for the network on the 15th of February this year. And during the, the launch event, we held a World Cafe where we had theme led roundtable discussions. So there was a, theme, a table for each of the themes and we discussed the topics that mattered to people. Everyone had a voice and we looked at different perspectives and we shared and listened to people. And during this World Cafe, we identified topics for research that people thought were relevant to the areas we were working in. 
Following on from the World Cafe, we then organised the topics into some research questions, working within our two ends of identifying the causes and consequences and, in, and effective ways to mitigate against these causes and consequences. And from this, we came up with our 10 research goals. And then within those 10 research goals, we identified three research questions. This was all from the World Cafe and proved prior knowledge and work that people had done in this area. So I won't go all th through all of these questions, but this is just an example to show you. So we looked at A1, which was to understand how people with SMI perceive and use green and blue space. And then we came up with three other questions that sit beneath that, that overarching statement. And for each of the five A questions that are looking about the causes and consequences, we've generated three research questions. After the webinar, we'll be posting these questions on our website. These give people an idea of the areas that we're interested in researching. So I'll just go through them. So we've got one for each of the different A questions, the three subsections. So this A3 is on technology and digital technologies. Just go back to A2, that was about green and, green and blue spaces and inequalities. A4 is about creative experiences. And A5 is about social inequalities for people with SMI. So moving on to the B questions, the um, developing the um, interventions to mitigate against these. So we've got some things around social prescribing, health checks, you know, different services, different groups. And B1. In B2, we've got some things around green and blue space and co-benefits um, for encouraging people to use green and blue space. B3 is looking at new technologies and existing technologies in terms of digital technologies. B4 is looking at um, preventing initiatives from generating further health inequalities. So that's and speaking to our health inequality theme. And finally, there's the new resource. And the format of the new resource in B5 is yet to be determined. But data sets are already being developed on green and blue space and on studies and reviews on digital technologies specific to physical health and SMI. So those are our research questions. So in our um, funding guidance notes, we've identified some research questions that we're particularly interested in being addressed. But we've got all these other research questions which we will be posting on the website that you can look at and aim to um, match your proposal to. If somebody has a really good proposal that doesn't sit with any of these, then please do feel free to submit that proposal. But we're really looking to address these particular research questions that we've identified here. So we're moving on to the final part of the webinar now. Does anyone have any questions? Are NGOs eligible to lead a funding bid, but they need a correct applicant that's an HER? So yes, that's right. NGO NGOs can lead a funding bid, but they can only co-lead. They can't lead singly on their own. They have to be a co-lead with an HEI. Will the funding go via the HEI in that case? Yeah, the funding will go via the HEI and then they'll distribute the funds. Uh, before the sample event, what do you recommend doing to try and find potential collaborators? In the first instance, I'd recommend that you got in touch with the theme leads if you've got a theme lead, if there's a theme in, in mind that you'll your question um, aligns with, then I'd get in, in contact with the theme lead and see if they know of anybody who's looking to do something similar to you and then they can put you in contact with them. Then please just send an email to the generic closing the gap um, email address and we can try and help you there. So we've got another question, will you be doing any virtual sandpits as travel to York might be tricky? We'd really encourage people to come to York to meet face to face, if at all possible, so that you can meet the people that you may potentially collaborate with if you, if you want to find somebody to collaborate with. But we're considering doing virtual sand pits if we find that there are a number of people who aren't able to travel to York. So that is something we'll consider, but we would really prefer people to come to a face to face sand pit and meet with us and, and meet potential collaborators. And also the opportunity to meet with the theme leads as well. Is it expected that team leads are included as co-eyes? No, it's not necessarily expected. They can be included as co-eyes, but that's not. Um, but they don't have to be. It's entirely up to you, and it probably would depend on the project. 
and, and what was most appropriate in terms of that project, but it's not expected that they have to be included as co-eyes. Our work is largely in, on oral health inequalities. I'm aware that this does not target, directly target the mortality gap. Would this be appropriate? Yeah, that would be worth looking at because it, it would um, tackle the health inequalities that we're looking at. And we are, one of our themes is health inequalities. So if you're looking at oral health inequalities, then it would be really worth go, con making contact with our health inequalities team leads. So a question from Twitter. Are applicants from outside the UK eligible to lead a funding bid? Applicants from outside the UK are not eligible to lead the funding bid. They can be on the bid, but they can't lead the funding bid. And the, fund and the bid must be um, aiming to benefit um, the UK. So just to add, we're, we're available on Twitter after the webinar. Join us at the webinar on the 7th of August. And thanks everybody for their time and joining us on this webinar. If you do come up with any questions, then please do let us know via Twitter or our closing gaps email, um, and we'll be happy to help you. Okay, so if nobody's got anything else they want to ask, we'll close the webinar now. Thanks everyone for joining.